Hello, it's Scott Manley here, coming to you from my bedroom. Because this place has a lot more natural light than my studio. And right now I have no electrical power because the local power company has cut power to everyone rather than risk getting sued for starting even more wildfires in California. Anyway, I did get to watch a rocket launch yesterday. It wasn't a huge affair, but it was streamed via the internet. It was a rocket called SARGE, Suborbital Autonomous Rocket with Guidance E. Uh, and this is by Exos Aerospace, and it's actually kind of the next, it's the spawn off Armadillo Aerospace. So these days we're used to Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, tech icons doing big rocketry and doing big things. But back around 1990, John Carmack, he started his own rocket company called Armadillo Airspace. He, of course, it was the guy behind id Software, the guy that made Doom and Quake and revolutionized or came up with a lot of the algorithms that work for you know video game computer graphics. The guy was a tech icon. And he was working with rocketry at a little lower scale. Now, they worked with a whole bunch of different fuels. They worked with hydrogen peroxide, methanol, ethanol. They even flew like a methane or methane oxygen rocket. And, oh, one of the cool things they did was they actually built engines for the Rocket Racing League, which is a crazy idea I wish I had actually flown. They, uh, well, they did fly, but they never turned them into races. The idea was to have racing planes powered by rockets and the races would be like an hour long their engines would only work for about four minutes so the pilots would have to light up the engines when they needed speed glide to conserve their energy and then land and refuel and then get back in the race so there would be a whole bunch of strategy trying to optimize the uh, speed and the power it wouldn't be like regular full power air racing i thought it would be a really cool idea uh, also, there was some guy called Jim Bridenstein involved in some way. Anyway, Armadillo Aerospace were probably best known for really building lots of small landing and uh, autonomous vehicles that could hover, land, fly, or translate, do all these things, because they were really interested in something called the Lunar Landing Challenge for the X Prize. That's where they would have to have an autonomous vehicle that would lift off under its own rocket power, uh, reach a certain altitude it would have to translate over and then land and it would also have to maintain flight for something like 90 seconds uh, to demonstrate that the engine was working. The landing areas would also have rocks and other obstacles because the, they were supposed to demonstrate collision avoidance as well and once they did that they would have a limited amount of time to refuel the vehicle and then fly it again because they wanted to make reusability a big thing. So uh, Armadillo, they developed a couple of vehicles called Pixel and Texel, obviously named after uh, uh, John Carmack's kind of background in computer graphics. These were squat, short vehicles with the propellant tanks arranged in a square so that the center of gravity was as low as possible, which meant landing and keeping them stable would be a little bit easier. So the competitions that they started these war in were in 2006, 2007. And while they were the only competitor to actually fly vehicles, they didn't win the prize, although they came close. They came within seconds, but their engine failed at the last minute. Um, so that was cool, but in 2008, they came up with a new vehicle. This one was called the Mod. And instead of having the tanks laid out in a square, they stacked them vertically on top of each other, like a more conventional rocket. And this was, in fact, able to win the level one prize. Again, they were the only competitor. Now, 2009 rolls around, the rules have been changed a little to allow the, the teams to do the flights from near their home base, which apparently makes it easy because now there's half a dozen competitors that all fly. Armadillo are the first people to fly and they do successfully complete the level 2 version. But Mast and Space Systems comes along at the end and they are able to fly the course and land with greater accuracy and therefore they walk away with the first prize of a million dollars and Armadillo only get half a million dollars for their trouble. So obviously that prize money was nice, but it certainly wasn't offsetting the costs of building all these things. I think John Carmack said he was spending about a million dollars of his own money every year. So they did have some government contracts in mind. There was an opportunity for essentially providing flight, suborbital flights, 
And so they evolved the mod into the super mod. They added aerodynamic fairings, control systems. And the idea was that they would be able to fly suborbital flights and then have this come back and using a drogue chute for stabilization, I think they could then land it under its own rocket power. Uh, that was that was cool. They ended up losing a couple of vehicles, but there was a great video of them demonstrating the uh, landing using a drogue chute and then relighting the parachute. But if they were really going to get it up to the high altitudes needed for suborbital tests, they needed to cut down on the amount of drag. So they evolved this into a rocket with a more conventional shape. Instead of using spherical tanks, they shrunk the tanks or stretched them into cylinders. And that gave them a rocket that was maybe half a meter in diameter and several meters tall. So this one was called the Stig, after Top Gear, obviously. Uh, this was great, and, and this actually was able to demonstrate flights at over 100,000 feet. But more interestingly, it was able to demonstrate booster recovery using a parachute. And it wasn't just you know dropping down into the middle of the desert. This was a steerable parachute and it would fly itself, dump the fuel, and then st uh, spiral down and land very near the launch site. Indeed, in one of their videos they say, yeah, we have to make sure that we don't simply tell it to return to its start point because there's a big launch tower there and we don't want it to hit that. So while this was a pretty cool vehicle and they felt that it could be developed into a viable commercial platform for this, they realized they would need a few million more dollars and it wasn't going to be guaranteed. And at that point in 2013, John Carmack sort of decided that he was getting out of the rocket business. He, he said he had the money sitting around to you know, do this, but his wife might not be so happy. And I totally understand that because I'm stealing the bedroom from them right now. But um, yeah... Armadillo Aerospace essentially went into hibernation for a couple of years because some of the team from Armadillo were able to go out and find an investor who was interested in this idea. So they got the money, they essentially purchased Armadillo's assets and became Exos Aerospace. And since then they have developed the Stig rocket into the Sarge with its own interesting acronym. It's now an 11 meter tall rocket, half a meter wide. It generates um, something like two, two and a half tons of thrust. It's uh, able to go, in theory, up to you know hundreds of kilometers if it works. It uses um, uses ethanol and liquid oxygen, pressure fed again. And yeah, they've had four different test flights. None of them have been hugely successful, but. I guess they're getting there. The, the great thing about Exos is they've been quite open in sharing videos from their rockets, even when things qu didn't quite go according to plan. Uh, I do actually really like that on the third launch, they included a pair of 360 VR cameras in each side of the rocket. So in theory, if you stitch those together, you could have a nice you know, 360 VR view of the sky. I, I'm gonna have to try that sometime. They have demonstrated booster recovery and for um, this one, unfortunately, didn't quite work. So we go to the launch, it takes off beautifully straight up. It certainly has lots of thrust, but immediately it starts to get into this uh, conical spiraling motion. And yeah, that just gets worse and worse and worse. And it's spending a lot of energy side slipping into the, the airstream, which means it doesn't accelerate nearly as fast as it, as it should. It also means it's not getting telemetry back to the ground because its antenna pointing is going all over the place. And at some point, the rocket cuts off the power because its uh, guidance ag algorithm predicts that it will land outside the safe area. So in order to make things not get any worse, they cut the power. And it's not clear what exactly happened at that point, but it looks like the fairing separates, or sorry, the payload separates correctly, and that has been recovered under parachute. But the booster parachute did not deploy, and the whole thing fell back to Earth with a bang. And it still had a whole bunch of fuel in it. They were worried about there being a fire and everything else. So yeah, um, not a great day for Exos Aerospace. Certainly, I hope they continue because they provide some amazing footage and it would be nice to see this very simple idea of a reusable sounding rocket finally come and, and work because 
there's a lot of payloads that get flown on these suborbital orbital trajectories that you know you're essentially throwing away these rockets every time. Um, of course, you know they are going to have to compete with things like Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin, but. You know, regardless, I, I like to see these small teams. And if you think about it, there's new space and then there's old new space. And Exos are a new space company that has roots in the old new space. So, yeah, new space, it's awesome. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.